But yeah, with Guy up and Nemor, that is... I don't know what Nemor's like, though. Nemor has managed to get in a few matches here and there, but... Like, one win, one buy. Whereas Guy up, we've seen play a few times and actually do pretty well. I'm a bit surprised they were matched up together. But like I said, I haven't, sp I haven't seen Nemor yet. So let's find out what they play like. Because... I haven't heard them. I, I mean, I think they're a team player... Because the name is familiar. I mean, I just haven't seen them in 1v1s because I mainly cast 1v1s for exhibition matches. And that is obviously not what is at play here. We are not seeing a 1v1. We are seeing instead a... Well, we are seeing 1v1. Sorry, we are seeing... A, we're not seeing an exhibition match. That's what I meant to say and didn't say. But anyway, Nemor... Oh, what are you going to build... I think Gaiop's going to go for probably... Oh, they're going to have Cloaky. Okay, that makes sense. Nemor, on the other hand, also Cloaky, so no spiders. I am disappointed. Not terribly surprised, though. Like I said, this map isn't bad for spiders, but yeah. That... Cloaky is just what people are playing. And that's... I mean, that, that's a solid factory. I'm not going to argue with it. It's definitely a factory I'd recommend to people who are just taking up the game. If they've never played the game before, the Cloaky Bot Factory has a lot of tools. It's a little tricky to play in the late game. It doesn't have a lot of heavy tools. You're going to want to switch factories sometime around the 10-15 minute mark, if you get that far in. Or depending on the amount of metal. If you have like 30-40 metal, that's around the point where you might want to consider switching factories. Not just getting an air factory, but adding in either a Strider Hub, or depending on the map, something like a Tank Factory or Jump Bots. <clears throat> Like, jump us for artillery tank factory for additional firepower. But yeah, Cloaky Bot Factory, very handy for the early to mid game. Really strong, has pretty much every role covered. And Glaives are one of the strongest raiders in the game. Especially for their cost, and especially for how fast they are. Just Yeah, they're a solid unit. So overall, solid factory. And Nemor going in with early gremlins. I'm not sure they expect a gunship rush, given Archer's Valley. I can't say I'm surprised. Or if they're just trying to use it as a scouting tool. Which is one of those strategies that goes in and out of the meta. People use it, and then people look for it, and then people stop using it, and then people stop looking for it, and then people use it again. I don't think it's really come up recently, though, and Anarchid was the main player I noticed that used it, and Anarchid's not playing in the tournament. I haven't really seen them play a lot recently. And apparently Kingstad was actually playing Spiders on that last map, put Fleas everywhere, and took the match. I mean, who was their opponent that round? Well, their opponents are Phileas, too. Wow, that's amazing, actually. Or Phileas is no one to sneeze at, so well done, Kingstad. Kind of wish I had scouted that. I kind of wish I had watched that one, but I figured, you know, go for the ones that I hadn't seen players of before. And so I did. Oh, well, that that sounds cool. I mean, I'm glad to know that spiders would work well on, Ot on Otago, or Otago. Because, I mean, spiders, you have the scouting. You can put stuff on the hills. You know exactly what your opponent's up to. That's the whole point of spiders, really, is get that information and then use that to play as intelligently as possible because they don't have the speed to do it any other way. At least not units besides fleas, and fleas don't have the firepower to fight on their own. Anyway, Nemor is nowhere near as expansive as Gaia has thus far. Gaia with a 5 metal advantage, though Nemor managing to get some fire in, getting rid of one of the metal extractors at the cost of a glaive, but still, that's a metal extractor. Not managing to deal with much else, and they are managing to get that gremlin for scouting, so they are doing exactly what I expected they do. Get the scouting gremlin, and no one's checking for it. Gaiev has no idea. If they are watching the stream, though, we I guess they'll we'll find out in two minutes if they're watching the stream, because they will see, oh, hey, there's a thing here I scout for. But yes, there is a stream delay on, so Gaiev cannot see it immediately. Demo will at least get a couple minutes of scouting off that. Pretty sure Gaiev's being honest, though, because at the same time, they would have potentially seen that beforehand. And actually, not even managing to see it, the automatic pathfinding just avoids that. Like, it's not like it can't path up there, it's just slower. The Glaive's deciding better to pathfind down the edge. That's really neat. So the Gremlin's actually in a quite safe spot given the map and given the way the pathfinder works. I did not expect that to happen. But, hey, that's how it works. Although at this point, that is no longer going to be the case. This glaive coming in here, short enough move, it's going the direct path, and it does see the gremlin. It does spot it. It has been scattered out. Guy up knows, but it doesn't matter at the same time. Nemo is managing to get a couple of metal extractors destroyed, getting a massive opening to work with. Getting a conjurer as well! Nemo is taking out everything Guy has and managing to expand at the same time. 
So, Gaia's early expansion, while helpful to get them some extra metal, and they are a bit ahead as a result, has pretty much ended. And also, no defenses in the main base, this character could go down. If this character goes down, that will be the end of the glaive, but at least that'll be one, well, it'll be ten less build power. However, I don't think the character is a big deal yet. It's a later game thing to worry about. It's something to worry about once Gaia gets more money. Right now, Gaia does not have enough of an economy to support both the factory and economy production at the same time. Or at least, support caretakers and economy at the same time. So, good for the later game, but Gaia would have probably rebuilt that before it became relevant. Still, not a bad shot. Got rid of a few metal extractors, put a bit of pressure onto Gaia, and now with Nemo coming in with the Reaver, and nowhere near enough glaives to stop that Reaver, Nemoir should be able to get yet another assault in here and possibly take out more, quite a bit more. The glaives on top of the Reaver, just extra support for the Reaver. This is a very strong position for Nemoir to start in. The only downside for them, as far as a strong position, is they don't have a caretaker here. They don't have anything building, actually, at all. Neither does Gaiob. In Gaiob's case, I can kind of understand if they're trying to build up more of an economy. Nemoir, on the other hand, they're just accessing. Oh, but if they were building... Oh, man, could you imagine they were building with all that metal? I mean, they need more energy, mind you, but still, they have enough energy in storage. They could have used that metal. They managed to build that. They got the caretakers in there. They could have had so many glaives. Because this is the thing I'm talking about with Future, is that Gaiop now has the metal to make use of all these caretakers. I mean, that's where Nemo's Assault, if they had hit the caretaker, would have been somewhat relevant, is that now we're having a stream of glaives. That wouldn't have happened as much had Nemo destroyed that particular caretaker, or both the caretakers. So again, that's a question of like dealing with the future of the game, or dealing with the future of that particular match. But at the same time, Nemoor does have a reasonably strong position in terms of their economy. They have a very strong position in terms of attrition. They've gotten double the attrition. Their commander is not at much risk. Some risk, but not much. Although, unfortunately, that's... Oh, that started us. Never mind, unfortunately, that was built enough that it did manage to get the death explosion. And thus, it does manage to get rid of those glaives, stopping in another assault and stopping Gaia from doing much damage. And there's the character that's going down. This is where it's really relevant. Gaia has the economy for the caretakers, but no longer has the caretakers. And this Reaver is just doing a complete number on everything. Not to mention, the Ronin don't have much of a range advantage because line of sight means that Reaver can just go around these solar collectors, completely avoid the Ronin, and possibly even use them as a flanking tool. But unfortunately for it, it will die. Fortunately for it, though, it did manage to get loads of value, getting rid of 20 build power, an extra 4 metal, putting Gaia below Nemo in terms of economy, except Nemo again, does not have the production capacity to quite use that. But still, putting Nemo at least ahead in... In, on paper. Actually, ahead in practice, too, because now that Gaiup lost those caretakers, they don't have the production capacity to use all that metal. They can, of course, build more economy and upgrade their commander if they wanted to, but they don't have the production capacity on their factory. So this gives Nemo a great timing to work with. Not to mention the fact that these are all Ronin, which means they're going to be quite vulnerable to the Glaives. I mean, five of them, that could still be death, but nope, that's not going to happen. The Glaives able to surround them, able to destroy them, actually able to ignore them. Not even going for that, just going straight for the throat. Now, I don't totally agree with that. I do think getting rid of the Ronin right now is the better option. Like, flank them out, kill them. You have the unit advantage. The Reaver's not up yet. It just got up, but it's not in position, so the Ronin are at least dead. Got some value off that. But at this point, Nemoor, again, just does not have the power production capacity. They don't have the caretakers. Like, at this point, energy is their biggest weakness, and, it, like, it's one of those things where if it's not for that, they would win. And again, guy about to lose their commander. There's nothing that can easily be done about this. This commander is going to go down. And, uh, I mean, at the same time, Nemoor is getting really close to it, so the explosion will kill off both glaives, or the rest of the glaives. But, hey, guy have lost all their storage, even more energy, and the raid is still going on in the middle of the base. The line of sight on the solar collectors, or line of sight block of the solar collectors, is stopping Gaia from being able to defend this effectively. And another character is going to go down as possibly as well. Hard to tell. Nemo is playing the micro game beautifully. Like, they know their micro tactics. Their energy economy isn't the most stable, but their unit handling is superb. Of course, at the same time, Gaia did manage to get the center expansion. If they get some power built around that, get strong defenses around that, they could turn that into an overdrive monster and make that become their main economy. If that happens, Nemoor is going to have a tough time. However, Nemoor, not aware of this. Not aware of this at all. Has some idea, because they do, they have some ghosts of the of the defensive structures, of the pickets. But they don't necessarily know the metal extractor is going to be there. If they knew that, I mean, they can kind of infer from the pickets. I'm sure they'd go for it immediately. 
the moment, though, not so much. They do have the airplane plant, however, they have caretakers to make use of this stuff, but again, it's the energy economy. That is their biggest weakness right now. Gaiap also has that weakness, but that's been forced. Aha! There we go! Metal extractor going... not going down. Nice lotus placement. Gaiap losing every support structure around there, so the next force coming in will be a problem. But when's that going to come in? Nemor's fact switching, but with no army to support it. So Nemor is actually in a really tricky situation right now in terms of timing. They're relying on Gaiap not having rebuilt because Gaiap did lose a lot of their economy and lost their commander. And that is actually a fair thing to have done. This is really smart by Nemor. They know exactly the timing they can actually safely do the fact switch because they're not going to get counterattacked. So at this point, they're getting rebuilt. They're getting their setup. Their energy is very nearly on par with their metal, so they going to be able to use all this build power effectively. And Gaiap has only just managed to rebuild. They still are missing a care still are missing a caretaker or two. So again, they can't use all their metal. Whereas Nemo, while they are energy choked, they are not that energy choked. Like one or two more power two or three more power plants, and they are good. Actually, just one more power plant, really. The metal is gonna go all the way down. Or no, two more. They need more. They need a bit more in the way of power. But not by much. And even then, the amount of build power they have pushing in with the energy they have is still enough that while they are accessing, they aren't accessing by much. And now with that, Gaiap's going to lose the center expansion. And with that, most of the advantage, the economy advantage they had, which again, on paper. Economy advantage on paper. Because the production has only just caught up to that. That being said, though, Gaiap does have a lot of storage and they don't have their storage walking around in front as a nice juicy target. Their storage now is in the middle of their base. Good luck getting back there, Nemor. If Nemor gets there, I think Nemor has the match. However, Nemor could very well get there because Nemor has, like I said, they got the timing on the back switch, turning them back into timing on production, and has managed to maintain a much stronger production base for the last minute or so than Gaiop. Because again, Gaiop just lost the opportunity to do so. Nemor took that away. At this one, however, the Reavers coming in here are essentially going to be a death sentence for anything in the way, and the Naked Expand along the path means that a lot of Nemo's economy is highly vulnerable. Some of it's going to get defended, but the Reavers are still going to make it a massively costly affair to do so. I mean, the Glaives will go down. Yes. Gaia will lose their Glaives. Nemo will also lose their Glaives. In fact, I'm not sure Gaia's going to lose their Glaives. Thanks to Nemo losing their Glaives. The Ravens coming in here are the only things that I think are going to be able to stop the Reavers. And indeed, that's the plan. So, Gaia has basically lost his assault. Nemo able to get rid of this, which is... Pretty necessary. That, like, if that didn't happen, that could have been death for Nemor. And even then, Nemor has lost a lot of ground. And a fair bit of their units as well. They're still ahead on attrition, but their economy has always been slightly behind this entire time. So, in terms of unit value, it's a little bit tricky. And I apologize for getting in the way, but, yeah. I never really have a chance to do that in the middle of the match. And it always resets to that center at the end of the match, which is a bit of a pain. But at this point, they're actually fairly even for, metal, for unit value. Gaia and Nemor both have essentially the same unit value. And that's saying a lot, considering that Gaia has managed to get massive value on the economy destruction, putting Nemor back down to a roughly 10 metal disadvantage. Well, 5 to 10, depending on or depending on overdrive. But actually, that's with reclaim as well. Nemor actually with a 15 metal disadvantage if it weren't for the reclaim. So, despite all the damage Nemor did, despite the great econ economic damage they did, despite the great micro they had, the fact that they were so energy stalled earlier on meant that they did not have the, the army they could have had with the metal they had, with the metal advantage they had and the production advantage they had to make this turn out any differently. If they'd had that, they would have been able to build the Raven sooner, they would have been able to build possibly Ronin sooner, maybe even another factory on top of this all. And that would have been strong. That would have been a great thing to see. But at this point, Gaiap has a very solid position. And at this point, Gaiap is going to be able to turn this around. Because Nemor essentially has been pu pushed back to their main base. They don't have a whole lot of workers used to rebuild. They have a couple. But really only the one. They have another being constructed. Or they did, I think. No. No, they just have the one. That's it. They have one Conjurer. And it's on reclaim duty. And it pretty much has to be. But at this point, Gaia was just able to stream out forces. I mean, mostly they're switching over to Trident's, making sure they get air control, because they might as well. The main disadvantage they might have is that they don't have air control. They have all these ravens on their back, and no easy way of dealing with them, or at least they had no easy way of dealing with them. 
But at this point, Nemor does not have a whole lot of map knowledge. They lost their radar. They lost most of their units. They don't know what Gaiop's up to. They don't know that these Tridents are coming up. And these Ravens, they've just now managed to get the air pads. They're just now managing to get set up in a way that allows them to be effective in large numbers. But the question, of course, is what's going to happen there? Because, I mean, all these Ravens are currently set to refuel at the factory, at the airplane plant. Not set to go to the air pad. I guess I have to do that manually. I mean, you do have to do that. Clearly, you have to do that manually. And that's exactly what Nemor has done. Like I said, Nemor's, Nemor's army control, Nemor's micromanagement is strong. That is clearly their biggest asset. But at the same time, it's also a little bit tricky if they can't build things in time. However, that is going to be potentially the problem anyway. Like, that's the thing. It's... Uh, Nemor, I don't know what they have to work with. Other than these... Like, they have the Reavers. They're against a lot of Glaives. That does present a potential opening, but at the same time... Gaia has so much knowledge of what's going on that Nemor doesn't have an easy way in. I mean, Nemor's going to get some damage in here. Maybe get a few Tridents, a few Glaives. Get a Reaver. At the cost of a Reaver. But then the Ronin are going to come in, and that's going to be it. And even with the the Ravens coming in, all the Tridents... Like, how many Tridents are here? There's a dozen? A dozen. There are a dozen Tridents coming in here. And while the Reavers... Sorry, the Ravers can hit the Tridents, they're not going to live long enough to do so. On top of all the rest of the AA coming in here, and they're... Are they going to the factory? No, they're just scouting. Wait, what? That's a vulture's job. Of which there are... Well, there's one. But, yeah, with that, Nemours basically lost the only real tool they had. Those ravens... The potential force projection they had, like, the ability they could have theoretically had to take out a bunch of metal extractors at once, really cripple Gaiap's economy, open things up to allow for... for Nemour to get in there and actually deal some meaningful damage... That's over. There's nothing left. Nemor has a threefold economic disadvantage. They have very little army. I mean, the unit value is now down by 10,000. So there's not much for them right now. Metal use as well. Like, they just don't have the economy. They had the economy up until about five minutes ago, and then just nothing. Guy off took off. Like, guy just took off. And Nemor lost everything. So really, a lot of this came down to the fact that Gaia happened to have enough forces coming from the production advantage they gained, or production they gained, while Nemor, when they had the economic advantage, didn't turn into a production advantage, and didn't manage to follow up that big attack they had earlier. Because they followed that up with strong production. I mean, the air switch wasn't a bad idea, but if they just followed that up with a strong production, strong economy, pushed a bunch of cloakies out, and then pushed into the base, struck while the iron was hot, it would have worked. That would have been enough. But yeah, that is that. So I I mean, Nemor, nicely done. I love your micro play. I would love to see Nemor play more 1v1s. Because that that micro play was I mean, that's kind of how I play, honestly. Like that's this is actually a lot of how I play. Like micro play, but having a bit of trouble remembering to build energy structures. But like I said, very strong micro. I like it. I really like it. So yeah, good job, Nemor. But again, Guy have taken the match. And with that, we are gonna see Nemor's gonna be 1-4. But with that, I mean we still have one more round. What the We still have one more round, so it is gonna be still a matter of getting the whole setup. Hey, towels! And people using towels! Yay! Oh, wait, can only subs use towels? I thought people watching the channel could use the towel. I'm not sure. At any rate, towels are thrown. Oh, right, it's not a vulture anymore. It got changed to an owl. That's right. It went from being a scavenger to being, well, slightly more majestic. Well, I don't like scavengers. Owls are hunters. Owls are hunters. Owls hunt things directly. Actually, I think Vulture kind of made more sense, considering, but I think that's another trademark situation. Regardless, that is the match. Nemor, that's all a matter of energy. All a matter of keeping the energy. But that is that, so... Well done to... Well done, well done Gaia. Nemor, however... Hmm. No, I've said, all my, I've said my piece on that one. 
Nimor did the job. Guy just finishing up. I'm actually kind of surprised Nimor's not throwing the towel right now. Like, I'm really surprised Nimor is still playing this out. But there we go. There's there's the win for Guy up. Getting quite a lot in, like I said before, like the sheer amount of metal production and income difference that came in about seven, eight minutes before the game ended. Like, really, that's all it came down to was a, one exchange leading to a massive difference in metal advantage. Leading to a massive, massive difference in unit value advantage. Because it was neck and neck until that point. Until the point where Guy managed to get a bunch of sneaky shots in. It was essentially even. In fact, slight advantage. See here, that's where the commander was lost. That's where a lot of damage was done. But nothing followed up. Because the energy income was not there. There was nothing there for Nemor to take advantage of the situation they'd made for themselves. Which is a bit heartbreaking. But that's the important thing about energy. But anyway, that was the last wrap of round six. We are on to round seven. This is almost over, guys. Well, the, the Swiss round. Well, actually, way faster than I thought it would be. I expected we'd be here for another couple hours for the Swiss alone. But anyway, we're on to round seven. Last round of the Swiss. And we are going to be watching whoever is on top. Which is... Actually, you can see before I do. Google Frog and Hokomoko. It's not Google Frog and Hokomoko. Google Frog and Kingstad. Google Frog, did they play Hokomoko already? They did, last round. They apparently won. Darn. Hmm. Well, Guy Up and Anir is the most even top level match, so I'm going to watch that. Because that is the match that has the most likely chance of being a relatively even match. Even though we just saw Guy Up like three times in a row. Oh well. I mean, Google Frog is up against Kingstad, who's not bad, very experimental, very creative, but it is Google Frog, so yeah, it's going to be tough. And. Oh, whoops. Ah, crap. And, oh wait, Diamond Friend and Google Frog have been the best one, but Diamond Friend's already played Google Frog, which I missed, which is a shame. Because Diamond Friend's on Poke Drool. Yeah, that's the thing about having seven round Swiss, is that five rounds, that's about the point where you get the really good matches. I and mean, we had Guy and Hokomoko, we had Google Frog and Diamond Friend, we had like really top level matches together. By the time you get to round six or seven, the top level matches have happened. So now you're stuck with like the best, the top player fighting the bottom player. Diamond Friend just has Poke Drool. So... Yeah. At any rate, Gaia versus Anir will likely be the most even of these matches. So that will be the one I go for. Actually, I mean, Hokemoko and Nikens could be even too. Hmm. Tough call. But yeah, on paper, Anir and Gaia is probably the most even match to watch. Hmm. Well, anyway, once that's set up, we will be on another map we haven't seen much of. It is Downpour. I haven't seen any of. Another totally unfamiliar map is Downpour, which is an FFA map, surprisingly enough. It's a lot like Adansonia. Or not Adansonia. It's a lot like La Isla Bonita. It's that kind of three-way water map. Although it's a bit more water-based than La Isla Bonita, and also far less choke point-based. So that'll be interesting. Because, I mean, the thing about Les de Bonita is that it's kind of neat and has the cool aesthetics. It's just very cliff-based, very choke point based It's very StarCraft-y. And that's... That's going to be it. So, yeah. Also, I should point out that because of the way that this tournament is organized, the top four players move on to the elimination bracket. Now, the thing is, Dime and Google Frog and Hokomoko, they've nearly got that locked. Like, Dime Frog and Google Frog have got that locked down. Hokomoko, whoever wins of Hokomoko and Nier, Guy of Kingstad, of those four, which could be three of them actually. Oh no, Google Frog's against Kingstad, so it's going to be a bit tricky. Those will also be in the top. So, Anir and Guy is a match where the winner moves on. And granted, so is Hokomoko Vikings. But, yeah, this is going to be... This is, like, really on the edge. So, I'd say that is the most exciting match to watch as a result. But, of course, we have to get that set up first, because this is a tournament, and we've got to make sure things are set up right. And there we go. Okay, so... With... Man, with this, this is... Well, three hours in. We have very nearly finished the Swiss portion of the tournament. And we're going to be moving on from there to... 
to the bracket and oh okay so apparently you have to be a sub to use the towel i thought you had to just be on the channel to use the towel apparently that is not the case that is good to know i guess i count as a subscriber to my own channel so that makes sense okay well i'll keep that in mind and apparently better twitch tv works with that oh well I was not aware, but at the same time, though, it is motivation to subscribe. So, eh. I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages. There's reason to do it either way. But at any rate, the... Hmm. I'm ready. We it start. I want to get this going. Because this is going to be very exciting. Then we move on to single elimination bracket. And that will be probably another couple hours, actually. I mean, this is a fairly long tournament. It's seven round Swiss into four person single elimination, best of three. Yeah, it's going to be at least a couple hours more. But anyway.